Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, these research for are uh, an important part of our life here at SICE and an opportunity to so. both learn more about what uh, all of us are working on and sure. to engage on some of the issues of the day. I want to start by thanking Isabel and Yanan and Brittany for helping to make this possible, which they do all the time and uh, can never be thanked enough, and especially for finding um, uh, regionally appropriate food for the occasion, which it seems a very good choice indeed. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure to have an opportunity to have uh, Professor Brands uh, here today. Uh, this is an all-China day today because uh, I hope you all know that later this afternoon we're going to be hosting Susan Shirk um, over at uh, uh, the uh, Kenny Herder, um, which will be uh, another opportunity to engage on this uh, uh, important topic, which is always important and, and timely, but especially timely in light of the, the recent uh, 20th Party Congress. I'm not going to introduce either Professor Gavin or Professor Brands. I know you all know them, uh, but just uh, to encourage you to, uh, after the presentation and the initial conversation between them two, to ask your questions and engage and share your thoughts. So with that, let me turn it over to Professor Gavin, who I think is next on the program. Well, Professor Brands is the Henry Kissinger Professor at Sice Johns Hopkins. He's uh, my colleague. Has the office right next yeah. door. Has written a lot he, of really good books. You can say he's the guy sitting next yeah, to me. He's I the think. guy sitting yeah. next to me, and he's 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 written a very important new book, which we're going to be discussing today. And I guess I thought the format that would make sense is that Professor Brands would talk about his new book for. Um, an hour or so, is that what you said? No, no, no. <laughs> 10 minutes. And uh, yeah. and then I would give some reactions and uh, questions that I have, and then we could open it up uh, to the audience. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. OK, awesome. Well, th thank you, um, Jim and, and Frank. And, and thanks to, to everybody who helped set this up. It's it's fun to be able to talk about the subject with the, the SICE community. Um, and in fact, I have been uh, inflicting some of my ideas about uh, China and the U.S.-China competition on my, my students in my uh, U.S. foreign policy class each each spring. And so it's nice to be able to to broaden the pain a little bit uh, to to this group. So um, let me, I'm going to go quick here because I, I think that the best use of the time would be to have more of an open open discussion. Um, so let me just say maybe a, a couple of things about the, the book. The, the first is the most, the most important thing, I think, to emphasize is that this is a, a co-authored book. Uh, and so my partner in crime on this uh, is a good friend, uh, Mike Beckley, who teaches at uh, Tufts University. Um, and we got the idea to do this about a couple of years ago when we realized that we were coming at the same problem from different perspectives. And so Mike is... Um, I don't know if you'd quite consider him a sinologist, but he's more sinologist adjacent than I am in the sense that um, he's, he's lived in China. Uh, he spends a lot more time thinking about the intricacies of, of Chinese politics and, and foreign policy. And then I was thinking about it sort of the pers from the perspective of patterns of great power relations in the, in the past and, and patterns of behavior of revisionist powers in, in particular. And so we decided to, to join forces uh, and write this this book. And, and so I think it goes without saying that if there's something that you liked in the book, I wrote that. Uh, if there's something that you didn't like, I can give you Mike's home address. Um, so in terms of the, the argument it, itself, let me just do kind of like five to seven minutes explaining what, what we're arguing and why in the, the book. And I, and I think if I had to, to summarize what we're trying to do, this is meant to be kind of a counterintuitive addition to the let's hyperventilate about China uh, genre. Uh, and so, uh, yes, we think that, that you know, the United States and, and other democratic countries should be worried about the prospect of an aggressive China, but, but it's a little bit different than kind of like the Thucydides trap argument you, you may have heard. I think our argument is that China has more problems than you may think, and, and that's actually why it may be more dangerous than you may think. And, and so part of what we're doing is trying to push back against um, what for a number of years I, I think had become the conventional wisdom or something close to the conventional wisdom in thinking about the U.S.-China relationship, which, which basically goes kind of like the U.S. was the great superpower of the 20th century, China is going to be the great superpower of the 21st century, it will surpass the United States economically and eventually militarily, and you'll get the sort of power transition uh, or hegemonic transition, as political scientists might call it, that has so often led to, to conflict and war in the past. Um, our argument is that there's, there's not going to be a power transition, that the China, uh, 
um, uh, has grown spectacularly. Its, its rise is, is real. Uh, if you look at its economic growth since 1978, it, it's absolutely remarkable. If you look at the way in which its military power has grown or its global influence has grown, there's no ga gainsaying any of these achievements. But the China is actually going to struggle to uh, surpass the United States and to achieve some of the geopolitical goals that it has set out, because in many ways its, its best days are actually behind it. That, that's certainly true economically, I would say. Um, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're not in an era where China is going to be replicating the 10, 12, 13 percent growth uh, year on year of the period from, say, the, the early 80s. Uh, to up to the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, China's fi economic performance had already tailed off considerably going in uh, to the COVID crisis, and it's gotten worse since then. And this isn't simply a reflection of, of momentary issues or acute problems. It's, it's more a result of structural factors, everything from changing demography, uh, which is going to exert uh, a major drag on the Chinese economy in the coming years, to the fact that the, the political system has changed in some ways that are, are clearly unhelpful for economic growth. Uh, in fact, one of the things we could see uh, sort of confirmed from the recent party congress is that you know politics now trumps everything else. There was a period where economic growth uh, was in some ways the prime directive of uh, CCP rule. That's clearly no longer the case. And Xi Jinping is willing to exchange economic growth for greater centralized political control over the economy and over the political system uh, as well. And you can go down the list. There are five factors we point to, all of which that are, are going to make it difficult for China to grow at anything close to the rate that it would take to um, presumably escape the middle income trap, uh, not, not, and, and, and even more so than that, to, to catch up with and surpass the United States. The other major problem that China confronts um, is what you might think of as strategic encirclement. And so for uh, you know, a good 20, 30 years after the beginning of the reform and opening period, or even going farther back than that, to the, the U.S. opening to China, or the Chinese opening to the United States, as you might have it in the early 1970s, the fact was that, that most of the world and, and most of the advanced democratic world was rooting for China to succeed. It was rooting for China to become more influential, was rooting for China to become more prosperous, rooting for China to become more deeply integrated into the existing international system. Um, of course, what's happened really dating back to the global financial crisis and its aftermath, but then accelerating since then, is that more and more countries have become worried about what a powerful, assertive China might do in its region and what it might do globally. Uh, and so basically everywhere China is pushing for greater influence now, a growing uh, coalition, or perhaps better said, a, a, a group of coalitions, of many coalitions, is pushing back. And so you see this in the Western Pacific, where the US and Japan are tightening uh, their cooperation within the framework of that alliance and thinking very seriously about how they might resist uh, a Chinese attack on Taiwan. You're seeing it through groupings like the Quad or uh, AUKUS, the Australia-UK-US partnership. You're seeing it in the way that um, even sort of non-Indo-Pacific groups like NATO uh, and the G7 are paying more of an attention, more attention to Chinese behavior. And again, I can go into lots of detail on, on this, but basically um, the period when China was able to expand its international influence without encountering lots of resistance from other powerful actors is, is over. Uh, and so in, in a lot of ways, um, this should be good news if you think of it from the perspective of, of the United States. The, the problem, though, is, is this, which is that um, countries don't peak or begin to decline in all dimensions at, at once. And so um, you can start growing very rapidly in an economic sense years before you're able to turn that into usable military capability, for instance. Once your economy stalls, you can continue pouring lots of money from economic growth, in, from prior economic growth, into your military. This is what the Soviet Union did during the 1970s. And so the, the position that China has reached now is one in which its outlook is getting darker, I would say, economically and strategically. But in a variety of key areas, uh, and military power, I think, is the most important one of these, um, China is continuing to get more powerful. And for a variety of reasons, uh, its military window of opportunity, the balance of power in the Western Pacific, for instance, is going to look more favorable to China toward the end of this decade than I think it ever has before and perhaps ever will after. And this is, this is a particularly danger, dangerous combination. If you think about, um, so let's say, the history of the 20th century, even going farther back than that a little bit, 
revisionist powers, so, so countries that, were, that wish the international system worked differently and looked differently than it does, they often become most aggressive or most risk acceptant, not when they are deeply confident about the future, but when they start to worry that the future won't, will not be particularly good for them, that they're running out of time to accomplish the objectives that they have set. Um, this, I think, describes the position that the Germany found itself in prior to World War I. I think there's some fairly strong parallels to the position that Japan found itself in in World War II. Both are complex stories that I'm happy to, to talk more about. Um, and in both cases, you had revisionist countries that, that chose to violently upset the status quo rather than accept a more depressing future of decline and stagnation. And so my, my concern, uh, and, and Mike's concern, uh, what we read about in the book, is that when you get into the latter part of this decade, China is going to be looking at a, a longer-term window of vulnerability as its economic and strategic prospects decline, but will have a very tempting window of military opportunity in the Western Pacific, and particularly vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Uh, and this is the point at which uh, Xi Jinping may become most tempted to use force to reorder the status quo to China's liking. Now, there's a crucial caveat here, which is that I, I'm not actually sure that if Xi Jinping uh, and the Chinese regime used force against Taiwan, even if they succeeded, I'm not sure that it would actually solve a lot of the problems they face, but that's, that's not really the point. The, the point is whether they can tell themselves that it would solve some of the problems that they would, would face. And so this is the scenario that I worry about. And, and the book is really devoted to kind of laying out um, the argument and the logic of, of why we're entering the most dangerous period in U.S.-China rivalry and then talking through some of the things that the U.S. might be able to do in, in coordination with allies and partners in order to reduce that danger a bit. But that's essentially the, the basic laydown. So why don't I stop there and we can just kind of have a conversation. Sure. Great. Um, I gather that my role here is uh, to respond um, to Hal's book. And the first thing to say, it's, uh, it's a real accomplishment. It's... Um, an incredibly important, well-timed, consequential book um, was written in a very accessible and engaging manner. Um, Hal is a terrific writer, and this comes through. Generated a lot of attention uh, and discussion. I was kidding him later that uh, our Secretary of State appears to be have read it and making statements based on it, unless he's got some intelligence that we don't know about it. Um, and it, it does what what all policy-relevant scholars hope to do, which is to interact with and actually, in this case, even help shape an important uh, policy debate. And it's an enormous accomplishment. And Hal and Mike are being congratulated. It's, it's, it's easy to forget how hard it is to pull something like this off, and that it's uh, really extraordinary. What I want to do is just highlight what I saw as the key arguments and then some questions that the book uh, generated for me. Um, and, um, and then we can have a, a larger discussion. And as I read the book, I saw four big questions coming out. And again, sometimes these questions emerged maybe not in ways <laughs> I may need that. <laughs> uh, you write that, these down. Yeah, between you and the dean stealing all my pens. Uh, uh, th they may not have been laid out this way in the book, but this is the way sort of I saw, saw them. The first, uh, this book's uh, a meditation on the causes of great power war. You know, regardless, I mean, there's a lot of focus on the U.S.-China rivalry here, but uh, if you get into the sort of... Um, kind of the intellectual architecture of the book. What it's really about is when and under what circumstances great powers fight with each other. And it's an incredibly important um, conversation. Embedded within is a lot of uh, important literature and arguments about this that comes from both history and the international relations field. They're very good about not forcing that in your face, but as someone who's been through that literature, uh, it's a very impressive ability to uh, pull in a lot of really important work on the question that's been done in the past few um, decades. There's all sorts of issues, issues here, whether great power war is caused by shifting power balances, whether there are windows of opportunity when states feel compelled to act because of these shifts, um, whether there's a, a kind of a sooner rather than later logic. 
whether wars are driven more by rising powers, falling powers, or when, as this book suggests, the powers has some mix of both rising and falling. Um, but the key here, and I think the important thing, is that the book focuses on structural changes in the balance of power and how great powers think about how that shapes the way they view the world and particularly how they view timelines. It's an incredibly important question. There's a rich literature on it embedded there and how it might make a really distinct contribution. The second big theme of the book is uh, the sources of long-term economic growth and how things like demography, innovation, trade and finance, and the structures of markets, both domestic and international, shape growth and how that growth connects to international conflict. Again, another very important set of literatures here. The argument is, is focused on China, but embedded in these arguments are larger questions about the nature of growth um, and its relationship um, to war. And there's a, a twofold argument that Howe and Mike make here. Uh, the first, and this is the one that's generated the most attention, although one gets the sense that it's becoming, I think maybe a year or two ago, it was not conventional wisdom. I'd say now that it's probably a 50-50 mix on this, and maybe the book has to do with this. But China's extraordinary decades-long growth uh, is stalling. And that the reason it's stalling is because of underlying structural forces that aren't going to be easy to reverse. Things like demographics, no one's having kids, everyone's getting old, environmental circumstances, China is depleting its natural resources, and market circumstances. Uh, uh, circumstances. The, China has been sort of cutting itself off from the global economy to a certain extent, and there's some question as it moves higher up the value chain. This is something that all economies go through. Um, so that's the first argument, that, that this stalling is both real uh, and it's unlikely to reverse itself. Um, the second argument that this makes, which is related to these first um, two uh, arguments, is that the most dangerous states are not the ones who are rising super fast or falling super fast, but are in this weird in-between place um, where you've had recent growth, uh, that growth has stopped, and you don't know what's coming for the future. Um, this is the part of the book, these two first parts, that I would say are the most political science-y, uh, for lack of a better term. There's a, they, they deal with a lot of long arguments um, about both great power war and the nature of, of growth or the most social science-y. Um, and the focus here is on structural mechanisms. The third part of the book is about China's grand strategy or its choices. Uh, this part of the book deals with what China wants, how we can know what it wants, what are its abilities to get what it wants, both now and over time, and how China perceives its own interests and abilities. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting stuff here, but basically the argument is, is that Chinese grand strategy is focused on three goals under the category of vast global ambitions. First, to take Taiwan. Second, to dominate the Indo-Pacific. And third, to shape world order such to benefit China's values and interests. Which leads to the fourth theme of the book, which is what should the U.S. do about this? Those three interests or desires all conflict with American interests. And so the book wants to take those um, interests seriously and think about the best American strategies, the best U.S. strategies uh, to respond to these Chinese ambitions that are taking place at a time when China's own situation is uncertain, its future uncertain, and it may um, uh, drive it to do things um, that could be particularly dangerous. Uh, you know, there's a variety of recommendations, but Hal and Mike basically want to identify the problem, want the U.S. to take it seriously, do things like shore up alliances, increase and in smartening defense spending, and just be better prepared for the looming danger. So. Very, very clear set of arguments, um, very clear set of prescriptions, which is uh, really uh, welcome. I have a few questions I'm going to throw out there, questions that I was left with that um, uh, I think uh, 
perhaps are answered in the book and I just missed it or perhaps uh, are worthy of further discussion. The first, and this is again inspired by my co-teacher and our dean, um, uh, who always looks at a particular problem every week and takes, it's the only time you'll hear Jim Steinberg say anything nice about Ken Waltz, but he'll look at the three images. You know, the first image, what uh, the structure of the system is, the second, the nature and the situation of the regime, and the, um, or actually reverse. The first being the particular leadership, the second, the nature of the regime, and the third, the structure of the international system. Throughout the book, those first, second, and third image explanations mix about, right? Sometimes it's the nature of the international system, the structural shifts in the balance of power that are driving the action. At other times, it's the nature of the Chinese regime, its history, its ideological orientation, um, its particular disposition, its authoritarian nature, and then at other times, it's the leader itself, Xi, who is uh, the focus of the action. So my question would be, obviously, everything in life can be complicated, but how you see the mix in explaining your story between those three images, and to play the counterfactual, right? So if you're looking to better understand what's driving the action, if you changed factors in any of the three, what would matter most? You know, we've just gone through the 20th Party Congress. What if in a sudden move, Xi was not given a third term. Would that matter? What if China became a de democracy um, overnight? Would that not matter? What if the international system, the structure of the system changed such that either U.S. growth increased dramatically or something else happened to change? So I guess I'd want your explanation for where what, what matters. Uh, the second question I had was, and you alluded to this, but I, it does, it's not clear to me how taking Taiwan reverses China's decline. Um, I could imagine if they did take it, it would be bloody, be an expensive occupation. You'd end up probably with a nuclear Japan, maybe a nuclear Australia, maybe a nuclear Vietnam. You'd be deeper cut off from the international system. You'd have an anti-alliance stronger than ever. And the factors that were driving your underlying decline would seem to be worsened. And so I guess what I was wondering, and you know, the chip making, it's, you can hold a gun to somebody's head and make them dig, goal, dig coal. It's hard to hold a gun to somebody's head and make them make the world's best chips. You can maybe do it for a little while, but that, that it's not really a good recipe for innovation. Um, so what I was wondering, does China simply accept it's in decline and says, yeah, we got to take Taiwan now, regardless of the consequences, because it's more important than anything else? Does it think it should take Taiwan because it will reverse the decline? Or does China actually not think it's in decline at all and would make this move because, you know, we're doing great, and Brands and Beckley don't know what they're talking about, and we're going to take this because we're, we're on the rise. Um, that then led to a third question, which was, how do you distinguish between China, China's desire to incorporate Taiwan into China, which is a long-held interest and goal, uh, with the desire for the other two goals, uh, regional and global domination? Um, as I alluded to above, doing the first certainly might not help you with the second and the third. Uh, and I guess, you know, on page 125, you say it's obvious that this is what China wants. And I, I guess I left the book not clear how one would test that proposition. Um, this which, which proposition? That, that, that I agree with you that China wants Taiwan. I'm not sure about the second and third goals. I, I guess what I want to know is how you would prove that China wants global domination. Um, and that relates to kind of a methodological point. You might be right, but I just, I, I want to hear you reflect on short of war, how would we know you were right? And then if the U.S. did everything you recommended, how would we know war was avoided because of it? And I, I, I know this probably sounds pedantic, but speculative exercises like these, I'm always interested in the people making the claims 
offering what not just their causal mechanism for why they think something's going to happen, but what we would look for in the world to say I am right or I am wrong. Um, I, the final question, I've got a bunch of other, but the final one, you know, whenever I'm reading a book, I'm always like, there's got to be rooting interests. Like, and so I couldn't tell. So I, I'd be interested in your, your answer to your question, these questions. Was China's rise inevitable and bad or, and preventable? And given that the cause of war is the end of China's rise, does that mean we should want it to continue? Um, relatedly, one can't read your book without thinking that China's grand strategy in the last decade under Xi has been really stupid. Um, they've made tons of enemies. They've angered the United States. Uh, they've killed off innovation and the sources of their growth. They've ignored big problems. And I started thinking, well, if they're an adversary, should I be celebrating this? Should I want them to keep doing stupid things? Or should I want Chinese grand strategy to be smarter? Um, I was thinking I was originally going to do this in a two by two political science matrix, but I decided not to. But anyway, and again, these are these are these questions might be reflections of my own ignorance, my own sort of poor reading of it. And I just sort of throw these out there as things that I thought about, um, which is a sign of how unbelievably stimulating the book was and how much I learned. All right, let me take a crack at these. So. Um, I actually counted 73 questions on your list of, of four, but let me, let me try to, to respond to a few of them. So the, the, first, the, the first one, right, and, and so, um, you know, given that we both come from a sort of historical background as opposed to a political science background, this, this answer won't surprise you, right, that it's, it's all of these things, right? It's the first image, it's the second image, it's, it's the third image, it's domestic politics, it's global politics. Its personality, just as you would expect, and in, in, in an actual explanation of a country's behavior, right? And, and so, one of the things we argue is that the United States has a, a China problem in the sense that China, an autocratic, CCP-led China that has whose power had grown as much as China's power grew from 1978 onward would cause problems for the United States in the Asia Pacific. It would challenge you know, uh, global arrangements, regional arrangements that were made at a time when the balance of power was very different, even if no one had ever heard of Xi Jinping. But of course, the United States clearly also has a Xi Jinping problem in the sense that Xi Jinping has become, has been far more willing than his predecessors were to accept friction uh, in the relationship with the United States and other countries to pursue kind of confrontational lines of, of policy on uh, multiple fronts at, at once, particularly over the past three or four years, uh, and basically just to take a much more antagonistic approach to the outside world than was the case for much of the reform and opening period. Although, as you know, of course, sort of what we could consider to be the assertive turn in Chinese foreign policy began before Xi Jinping. And so it speaks to the, the fact that all these things are a little bit mixed together. So. You know, it's you know which one of these things is is dominant. Um, I th my, my, I think the argument that we're making in the book is that personality is not the dominant issue, right? That that what we're really looking at is changing dynamics in the international system combined with um, what you might consider almost structural drivers of Chinese behavior, and and so that might be you know, historical narratives about China's role in the world. It might be the nature of the CCP regime. And I'd say those are probably doing the majority of the work in our analysis, even though we think, you know, Xi Jinping is important uh, as well. You know, you asked, you know, how, how would things change, right, if, if like, Hu Jintao had kicked Xi off the stage rather than, than vice versa. Um, I, you wouldn't get a dramatic turnaround in the U.S. China relationship overnight, but under a different leadership, I mean, you, you presumably would have less of kind of the tripling down on political control and kind of a very dark view of the security environment, even at the expense of economic growth. I could see, you know, under an alternative set of Chinese leaders, more of the caution that China displayed 
you know, in the 1990s and 2000s about triggering balancing behavior, right? That was, that was always one of the hallmarks of Chinese behavior during kind of the hide your capabilities and bide your time era. Uh, and you could go down the list, right? So if, how would it change, you asked, how would it change if China was a democracy? Well, you know, I think a democratic China would not, the, re, the leadership of a democratic China would feel less existentially threatened than the CCP does by the very nature of international system led by a democratic superpower. And there are certain things that the United States worries a lot about now that you would presumably worry less about if you had a democratic uh, China. And so Aaron Friedberg has made the point, and I, th I think it's persuasive, that um, if China were run by a democratic government, even if it sought regional hegemony in the Western Pacific or East Asia, it would be unlikely to seek that through means of a military surprise attack and the way that the United States worries a lot about now because surprise attacks are just harder to carry out. You know, strategic surprise much harder to carry out by a democratic government. All right, um, second question. How does Taiwan reverse China's decline? Well, I, I want to say, it, taking Taiwan, how, how does that reverse China's decline? I'm not actually sure that it, it does, but I, I don't think that's actually the relevant question, right? Because um, in, you know, enacting the Schlieffen Plan did not reverse Germany's relative decline vis-a-vis -vis its enemies in 1914. It led to Germany getting crushed, right? Attacking Pearl Harbor did not reverse Japan's imminent military decline vis-a-vis -vis the United States. It led to Japan getting crushed. The, the, the argument that we're making here is that when, when countries find themselves in a situation where the future looks dark, but they have a moment of opportunity, they are more likely to embrace very risky strategies, even if those risky strategies do not have a 51% chance of success. And of course, the extreme version of this is Japan in 1941, where I think most Japanese leaders understood they had a very slight chance of success uh, in a war with the United States. So the, the question is, you know, can uh, Xi Jinping or other Chinese leaders, can they tell themselves a story? Can they convince themselves that um, taking Taiwan makes their problems more manageable, even if that story doesn't necessarily seem persuasive to us. And I, I think the answer is, is maybe yes, right? So you can tell yourself a story that if China manages to take Taiwan, then it has ruptured the, the first island chain, right? It's, it's ruptured this, this line of American partners and allies that blocks China's access to the Western Pacific. Um, it actually gets a lot of concrete military advantages from doing this on, on things as kind of as mundane as it becomes a lot easier to flush attack and guided missile subs out into the open uh, Pacific. Maybe um, if the United States is seen as being unable or unwilling to uh, defend its sort of you know, quasi ally in Taiwan, that probably doesn't break the U.S.-Japan alliance, but, but maybe it creates a lot of doubt in the minds of, the, of weak, you know, weaker U.S. allies in the region, the Philippines. Uh, for instance. And, and so I, I can see a scenario in which Chinese leaders think that they actually get meaningful strategic advantage out of this, even though I, I'm not actually, I'm with you in the sense that I'm not actually sure that that's the case. You, you might wake up with a Japan whose nuclear debate has just gotten a lot more interesting, right? You, you might wake up with a United States that is now spending 7% of GDP on, on defense. But, but leaders' expectations do not always map on to reality. And the fact that these sorts of gambits don't always work out doesn't mean that leaders don't undertake them. By the way, you can make a similar argument about Putin and Ukraine, right? And so how did attacking Ukraine make Vladimir Putin's position better? Well, clearly it did not. And yet he talked himself into it nonetheless. Um, Taiwan, regional, global type stuff. All right, this is a, this is a very big debate. Um, let me just say that if you simply look at China's territorial claims, right, maritime and territorial claims, that's regional hegemony right there, right? Because China claims Taiwan, it claims basically all of the South China Sea, a big chunk of the East China Sea, and basically like a, a size of, uh, you know, territory that India controls that's equivalent to a medium-sized European country, right? And so if you just think about Taiwan and sort of the two critical um, you know, call them inland seas, not inland seas, but sort of inner seas in East Asia, that looks a lot like regional hegemony to me. Add in the fact that um, the Chinese leaders have been very clear that they do not like the U.S. system of alliances 
in East Asia. They would prefer sort of an Asia for Asians arrangement in which the United States has been kicked to the sidelines. Uh, and thus, the diff power differential between China and its neighbors becomes the dominant factor in, in regional affairs. And I'm, I'm pretty comfortable making the, the regional uh, primacy argument. On the global stage, I, I, I don't, I may be wrong, I don't think we use the term global domination uh, in the book. I, I think we say global primacy. And I, I think of that a little bit different. Um, you, I, may, I may be wrong, and so please, please correct me if you find it. But in any event, um, you have seen over the past decade, and I should acknowledge this I think is the piece of our discussion of China's aims that is most contested among China watchers. I think there's an open debate. But, you know, uh, if you look at sort of Chinese uh, government-directed media outlets, if you look at some of the statements the Chinese leadership has made about the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, if you look at think, some of the things about community of common destiny and, and so on and so forth, they, they clearly bespeak a desire to come up with a, an international system that looks very different than it is today, where um, you know, U.S. alliances and, and partnerships are no longer sort of the dominant geopolitical fact in international affairs, where international norms are more uh, commonly set in, in Beijing, where China is at the center of the world economically and technologically. It's hard for me to see how you get that without being the most powerful country in the world. Um, last, last point, um, was China's rise inevitable and bad? It was definitely not inevitable. Um, now, at, at some point, a country uh, as large and vibrant as China was going to play a much larger role on the international stage than it had, you know, say, between the mid-19th and the mid-20th centuries. But, but the rise that it has experienced was in some ways serendipitous because it required you know, four or five big things to come together. It required the geopolitical conditions to be exactly right. It required um, the economic policies to be right. It required the CCP to move from sort of you know, Maoist totalitarianism to um, a still fairly brutal but, but more responsive form of autocracy uh, under Deng and, and his uh, successors, and, and so on and so forth. And, and so it wasn't in any means, by any means, inevitable. Was it bad? No, I, I, don't, I don't think it was bad, if only because, you know, one of the consequences or the outcomes of China's rise has been to bring hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty, right? And that's, that's a good thing. Now, like anything in international politics, you know, if you're thinking about this in sort of, you know, relative advantage terms, it has good sides to it and it has bad sides to it. And, and you can make the same point about the question that you raised about do you want to root for China to keep growing or not. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll lay my cards on the table here. If the question is do I want China to grow at 10% a year for the next 30 years and become by far the richest and most powerful country in the international system, absolutely not, right? That's not, that's not a world that I think would be particularly comfortable for the United States or other democratic societies as long as China is run by the CCP. You know, do I think that a slowing China is going to be dangerous in other respects uh, as well? Uh, absolutely. And I think that's just kind of like the world that we live in. And so the, the question is not, you know, what might you want in an ideal sense? It's what is the strategy that you try to devise to deal with the world that you live in? And, and as I think, you know, as I hope we acknowledge in the book, you know, the strategy that we recommend, there's some real risks to it, right? And so if part of the problem is you have a China that thinks its window of opportunity is closing and it sees the United States acting more assertively to counter Chinese influence and power, then, then one result of that could be to simply accentuate the closing window dynamics that, that worry us. I, I think that is an unavoidable tension because you either have to do that or you have to be willing to just accept what I would consider to be a fairly dangerous degree of vulnerability in a variety of areas. That I that I care about, but but it's it's there are real trade-offs on the question. There are real tensions um, uh, on that particular line line of argument. I think we just have to be upfront about that. Great answers. Uh, related to that last one, though, I wanted to ask what convinces you that Chinese leaders see their own situation as darkly as you do, and if they don't, what would that do to your argument? Well, she she's report to the Party Congress. Um, makes me think that he's seeing it pretty darkly too, right? And, and so, I mean, look, so there's, there's, if you go down, um, 
on each of the dynamics that we, we talk about, you can find evidence of, of Chinese leaders either in what they are saying or in sometimes in what they are um, forbidding from being, they are preventing from being said, that there is deep concern around a lot of these issues. And, and so going back about a decade, if not more, you've had um, Chinese leaders talk about some of the pent-up imbalances in the Chinese uh, economy and the prospect of, of stagnation. Um, there is clearly concern over the prospect of demographic decline, which is why China keeps going, keeps revising the number of children you're allowed to have, right? One child, two child, three children, uh, so, so on and so forth. Um, you're seeing more um, geopolitical commentators, some of whom are, are pretty closely aligned either with the PLA or with the diplomatic establishment, um, talking about the dangers that China is confronting because it's increasingly running up against multilateral resistance. Um, and you can go on down the list. The, the reason I mentioned Xi's report to the Party Congress is simply that it, it was quite striking for how dark the view of the international environment was, right? And, and so there's much less discussion about a period of strategic opportunity, much less discussion of, you know, the next decades will be dominated by peace and, and development, which had been kind of the, the rhetorical hallmarks of these sorts of statements for a couple decades prior, you know, much more warnings about dangerous storms ahead, need to prepare China for conflict, and, and so on and so forth. And I think it speaks to precisely the fact that, you know, when China looks at U.S. policy, when it looks at what Japan is doing, uh, when it looks at what, what other countries are doing, there's a lot more reason to be worried about a world that is far more resistant to China's continued growth um, and influence. Great. Well, I will ask one more question and then turn it over. I, people should prepare their questions. I don't know how we should do this. I guess raise your hand. But um, uh, one thing I was interested in, because when you answered about the, the structure, of the international system and the structure built into China being uh, more important, one of the things I, I was reflecting upon is whether the features and nature of the international system changes over time, because obviously you guys make a lot mm -hmm. of Villamite Germany, make a lot of Japan in the 1940s. You know, and I mean, you've heard me make this argument before, and we've had this discussion, but um, when I think about a Germany at the turn of the century facing kind of a fear of a Malthusian curse, population going up, desperate need for land, iron, coal, steel, wheat being the measures of power, mm -hmm. um, you can see the motivations for conquest and war. The story you tell about China, it's a shrinking population, it's older, the sources of power are emerging technologies, land doesn't really seem to help you, um, you know, yes, you need some coal, but you know, we're pretty good at making wheat and things like that now, and that's only gonna get better. And if, if the sources of power are emerging technology and innovation economy, um, is that Wilhelmite World War I model I mean, I guess I'm interested in why yeah. that model yeah, is so yeah. powerful for you. Well, I, I love this question, and I got a bunch of different answers to it. And so, so one of it is that China doesn't actually have most of the things it needs for growth and to feed it. You know, it can't feed its own population, right? It, it doesn't have sufficient energy resources to power uh, its economy. And in both cases, it is very dependent on an open global economy, and Chinese leaders feel that that is a point of vulnerability for them. The, the second point I would make is that, you know, China's not quite behaving as though it, it lives in this postmodern, say postmodern, sort of, you know, like, sort of like post, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm going to stick with post industrial. Post industrial society, right? And, and so, or post, Something that is post the need to go out and assert control of resources, right? Post imperial, post yeah. And so, I mean, because that's that's of course a lot of what China is doing in the South China Sea, right? And and so one of the reasons the South China Sea is so important is the natural resources it contains, from from fish to energy. Uh, and so you're seeing behavior there that that looks to me very familiar, right? I mean, the the, the forms of it change over time, but I think that sort of familiar that sort of behavior would have been quite familiar to, you know, say, the imperialists of the 19th or the early 20th century. And then the other, I mean, I guess the last point I would make is that, like, I just have a whole lot of trouble separating or disentangling kind of 
two two points that you make, and I'm I'm extrapolating a little bit from your question here, just because you know we've talked about this before. Um, you know, one of the like one of the arguments is that just like conquest is less valuable than it than it used to be, and you know the the thing I always have trouble figuring out is is that because something fundamental from like the god's eye view of the international system changed or is it because for the past 75 years we've lived in an international system where the most powerful country in the world has tried to make conquest as unprofitable as as possible right um and so i i tend to think it is more the latter right because you, you still see attempts at conquest right we're, we're living through one Right now, and, and you know, I'm not trying to draw a direct comparison between U Ukraine and Taiwan or anything like that. But again, you come back to the question: like, how does conquering Ukraine make Russia stronger in the international system? And, and I think it was on an email exchange we we're having. I thought you made a very variety of persuasive points about how it, how it doesn't, right, and how it doesn't actually benefit Russia in an economic sense or maybe even in a strategic sense. And, and yet. You know, it, hap it happens non nonetheless, right? And, and so there, there appear to be kind of like other drivers of human behavior. And it, it, to me, it seems like those drivers have been suppressed over the past 75 years, but they might not forever remain suppressed, you know, if, if the system cracks or, or something like that. And so that, that's why I have, I guess, a little bit more of a traditional view of international politics than I, than I think you were getting at in, in your question. Excellent. Let's open it up and if uh, raise your hand and just tell us who you are. See a hand back there. See a hand there. Hi. My name is Nick Johnson. I'm a second year student here at SAIS. Uh, my question relates to if we accept the danger zone argument, what does the Biden administration's national security strategy get right on China and what does it get wrong on China? And then, as a corollary to that, could you not argue that? Uh, if you're in Beijing, from, from, like from the view of U.S. domestic politics, if you have a Republican win the next administration, you're going to get a president likely ambivalent to defending Taiwan. And if you get uh, a second Biden term, you get a president who's not funding defense to the degree that Professor Brands would yeah. would like. That's, um, thank you. So on, on the first one, I, I, I don't, I actually don't think the second, I, I disagree with the second part of the, the question in the sense that um, what all of the Republican, likely Republican candidates for president in 2024 have in mind is that they really don't like China, right? And so e even the ones who are kind of like more bought in, either because they're Trump or they are Trump light on kind of the MAGA foreign policy, you know, Josh Hawley, no, no friend of, of China and the Communist Party of China, right? So, so you're still going to get a very assertive U.S. foreign policy. And actually, one of the things I that kind of scares me to death is that the, the politics of the Taiwan issue are about to get so, so stupid in, in the United States. And in the sense that, I mean, do you guys remember like in the 2016, 2015, 2016 Republican primary debates, it asked the question, should the United States get out of the Iran nuclear deal on day one, right? And everybody would raise their hand. Strategic clarity on Taiwan is gonna be that issue in the Republican primary in, in 2024. You already see um, former Secretary of State Pompeo saying the United States should extend diplomatic recognition to, to Taiwan, which, which might very well start a war. Um, and, and so he's going to drag that debate to the, to the right. And, and I think it's going to create some, some very challenging dynamics. Um, on the, the first part of the question, I would say that the direction of travel in U.S. policy toward China is broadly right but I'm not sure about the, the speed of, of travel. Um, and on, you know, on the, the defense side, which we've talked a lot about, you know, obviously for the past five to seven years, DOD has been very clear that preparing for a high-end contingency with China is its primary priority. You see the United States you know, getting more serious about you know, either bilateral arrangements with existing allies in the Pacific to think about responses to a, a China contingency or trying to knit together sort of minilateral groups in, in the region. Um, you have seen more and more U.S. officials, I mean, I, Frank mentioned this, like, Mike and I like the joke that, like, by the time the book came out, it should have been called an impassioned defense of the conventional wisdom, right? And, and so, like, in, 20, in 2020, if you told people that, 
um, China might invade Taiwan in 2025 to 2027, like nobody believed you. And now I think that has almost become the conventional wisdom in, in DC. Not, not quite, but right at sort of the level of problem diagnosis, and you can, you can agree with it or disagree with it. You see more and more people in positions of power saying that. But like the US defense program is still geared toward a conflict in about 2033, right? And, and so you can make similar points about you know, the implementation of Taiwan's overall defense concept. Japan just just very recently appears to be making a pretty significant shift. So there was some reporting about a week ago that they, they are now embracing a strategy that's much more about acquiring capabilities now because they worry a lot about the 2025 to 2077 window. But they're, they're the exception, right? If you look at AUKUS, right, we're developing subs that will be ready in 2045, right? And the other advanced capabilities that will be ready sooner than that, but, but not soon enough. And at the same time, and this is kind of where the sequencing gets, gets tricky, um, you know, the semiconductor regulations that the Commerce Department handed down a couple of weeks ago, um, that's, that's generally consonant sort of with stuff that we talked about in, in the book. And so I don't have a huge critique with that on the merits. What, what I worry, though, about is that if you get one piece of the policy that's much more aggressive and forward-leaning than others, that's when you do start activating these, these really, you know, scary window dynamics. And so I, th I think that's going to be a, a problem to watch in U.S. policy in the coming three or four years. I think Professor Murtha has his. Thanks, Isabel. So thank you, Hal. Thank you, Frank. This was a great presentation and a really great discussion. Um, I'll try to be quick because I, I have two questions and I want, I know that time is short. Um, so on the, um, on the first one, um, and I hate to kind of invoke Waltz yet again, uh, much to your and probably Jim's chagrin, but I was thinking more in terms of the interaction between kind of the, the, the first and second images, which is to say kind of the elite and domestic politics within China, uh, and how that, because uh, I still operate under the assumption that um, the nine out of the 10 things that keep the Chinese leadership awake at night are domestic in nature, not international. And so how does that, you know, how does that, so it's not simply just an error term or a, uh, you know, I mean, it's really kind of the, a big piece of the pie of what they're, you know, what they're concerned about. And another part of that is once the honeymoon period is over in a lot of these BRI uh, target countries, uh, I think China's foreign policy is gonna be kind of, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word quagmire, but it's really going to be kind of uh, pulled down and uh, and made a lot more uh, complicated. The second quick question is um, has to do with the analogy about Pearl Harbor, and I was just you know with Taiwan, and I'm just thinking a lot of it has to do with getting the the, the timing right, the, the time horizon right, and all of that. I, what I'm thinking though is. And you made a, you have a great quote at the end of your presentation, Hal, where you say conquest is a lot less valuable than it used to be. Um, I'm thinking that if I were the Chinese leadership, I'd want to get as close as possible to that without actually doing it. Um, because I think if things work out and it's successful, all the bad things that Frank <laughs> laid out, I think are gonna happen. Um, if it fails, all the bad things that Frank said are gonna happen, are gonna happen, and the party's over, literally and figuratively. And so that's, even though the probability of success gets higher and higher, the cost of failure, I think even, doesn't increase at the same, at the same rate, but is still, you know, it's, it's not going down. And so I, that calculus, I'm wondering is how, how, how you would uh, respond to that. Thanks very much. All right, so let me, let me try to answer these um, quickly, and I will do so with a lot less richness than they deserve, because they're all good questions. If I'm interpreting the last question right, I, I would say I, I think it is absolutely Xi Jinping's preference to achieve unification with Taiwan without using force, right? Be because he understands it would be a big gamble. The, the problem is that it ain't going to work, right? And, and so there, there's just nothing in the trajectory of Taiwanese politics over the past eight years to suggest that, you know, using pressure and increasingly military pressure, economic pressure against Taiwan is making the Taiwanese populace more eager for unification with the mainland. It's, it's precisely the reverse, right? And especially now that um, Taiwan has had the benefit of seeing what's happened to Hong Kong. And, and so what I, one of the, the triggers that I think a little bit about in this context is at some point, 
at, during this decade, I think it's going to become clear that the strategy of using coercion short of war to get Taiwan on the right trajectory from Xi Jinping's perspective just is that that has run out of road. And maybe it's the 2024 elections, right? If you get a third consecutive DPP term uh, for the presidency, and particularly if the DPP president, as somebody makes Tsai Ing-wen look pretty moderate on independent uh, issues, which, which is not at all an unrealistic possibility right now. And, and so then the question becomes, all right, your, your first preference isn't going to happen. And so then, then what do you do, right? Do you give up the desire to bring back Taiwan you know, back into the grasp of the mainland, or do you embrace higher risk strategies? Um, BRI and debt crisis, to totally agree. Um, uh, China's got its own debt, it's, it's got a debt crisis coming towards the end of this decade. A lot of the BRI loans, you know, were made kind of middle part of last decade, a lot of 15-year maturities and things like that. Depending on what region you look at, a very large number of these loans are not going to be repaid, and they're certainly not going to be repaid on time, right? And so that confronts China with a real strategic dilemma. Do you insist on full repayment and make yourself very, very unpopular, or do you take hits on the value of the loans and potentially jeopardize some of the banks that made them, and you potentially annoy the Chinese population at a time when you know, economic growth is sluggish, and so on and so forth? So I, so I actually I agree with you on that. Um, elite and domestic politics within China, I mean, the, the very crude answer I would give now is that um, you know, for, for 25 years after Tiananmen Square, the, there were sort of two primary pillars of CCP legitimacy, right? Economic growth and, and nationalism. Economic growth isn't looking like such a persuasive pillar of legitimacy anymore. So what are you going to do? You're going to lean harder on nationalism. You're going to hard, lean harder on repression. And you're going to lean harder on sort of like old school, like Maoist type mobilization. Although I don't, I don't want to draw that parallel too far. And I don't think any of those are particularly good news from sort of a US perspective. Hi, Rachel Hinkes. Um, question regarding if, if China resolves to use force uh, to take Taiwan. I've heard two sides of the argument um, regarding nuclear. One saying, hey, both China and the U.S. have second strike capability, so it's unlikely the war goes that direction. But then the flip side being what you're talking about here of this is kind of an existential threat to China in terms of its power and legitimacy. So would they be, you know, what's your perspective on, on use of nuclear? Would they be more inclined to go that direction or, or not? Well, I want to hear from Professor Gavin on this because this is what he actually studies. I mean, I, I would, I guess I, I would put it this way. I, I think it is extremely unlikely that the United States would use nuclear weapons first in a conflict with China over Taiwan, even if Taiwan was about to be conquered. I just don't think the, the stake is worth it from an American uh, perspective. But I, but I do think that nuclear weapons would still play a very important role in, in the crisis in, in one of a handful of ways. And, and so first is that, I mean, one of the reasons I believe that China is dramatically expanding its nuclear arsenal right now is it does not want to be subject to U.S. nuclear coercion in a crisis over Taiwan. It wants to remove any possibility that the United States can threaten nuclear escalation uh, in the event of a conflict over, over Taiwan. And so even if no one is making nuclear threats, right, nuclear weapons are still there influencing the course of events. Second, I, I think it is entirely likely that China might try to use nuclear coercion of its own in a, in a Taiwan crisis in the way that Vladimir Putin is using nuclear coercion right now, right? And so you, you attack with conventional forces, you try to grab something, and you make nuclear threats saying, if you get involved, right, be careful about what might happen. And then the third scenario is that, um, you know, the conflict goes poorly for somebody. It goes poorly, let's say it goes poorly for China. And, China, and it looks like the invasion is not going to be successful, and China's losing you know, hundreds of ships and, and things like that. Does the leadership in Beijing try to use nuclear weapons either for military purposes, so to knock out um, US air power on Guam or something like that, or just to kind of like psychologically reset um, the, the conflict? It, it would be a huge risk for China to do that, and it would in some ways compound all of the costs that, that Frank and Andy have talked about that China would, would pay for an unsuccessful, even a successful attack on Taiwan. The, the thing that gives me a little bit of pause in saying that they definitely wouldn't do it, though, is, is just 
if you do get into a situation where, as Andy says, you know, that, that you're looking at the end of Xi Jinping or you're looking at the end of the Communist Party, like those stakes are already existential. And so why not embrace a higher risk strategy of escalation or threatened escalation, even if you think it has a low probability of, of success? It's the same thing I worry about with, with Putin right now. I don't know that I would say it was li it's likely. I don't think it is. But it's enough of a possibility that I can't you know, easily dismiss it. What, what do you think? Um, I think everything you said makes a lot of sense. I, my only comment is, I guess it was probably about a year and a half ago when Phil Zellico and Bob Blackwell were doing their CFR uh -huh. report on the Cross Straits military situation. When they asked me to sort of comment on it, I said, there's no mention of nuclear weapons here. And Phil responded, well, it's not important enough for nuclear weapons, which got me thinking, well, why do we have nuclear weapons? Like, it's hard to, to imagine. I don't think Canada's invading us anytime soon. Um, and the, the, the second thing is that I've always thought, you know, if you think of the first decade of the two, 21st century as China's smart grand strategy and the second de decade as its dumb grand strategy, I always thought one of the clever things they did was you know, the one thing we know that China does is they just say, just don't do what, do the opposite of whatever the Soviet Union did. Um, the Soviet Union got involved in an incredibly expensive counterforce arms race that helped expose its own weaknesses. And I think Ch my hypothesis had always been that China figured out that was really, really stupid. One, because it exposes our weaknesses. And two, because the United States is never going to use nuclear weapons, yeah. right, which they're not on this. I do think there are scenarios where you look at some of these military, where if China launches some kind, you see some of these war games where there's a preemptive strike on Guam, on bases in Japan. Um, but I also think, and we should pull our dean into all of this, because it always struck me that when um, the U.S. military was moving to their, you know, air sea sort of ideas. It was to say, well, because we're not going to have nuclear options, we've got to find capabilities that can do some of the things that we like to do, because we're just not going to use nuclear weapons. So, but but this is as with everything nuclear, it's like insanely speculative. So, yeah. um, which we should, we no one has thought about any of these issues raised in this book more than than our dean. So we should we should give you a chance to come. I, I'm not. I don't have any questions in the back. That's why this is my kick standard strategy. We know if they'll if they'll ask questions. But. So just one observation. I mean, my my observation on the nuclear is that I think there is just a profound disconnect between the academic game playing, thinking about nuclear weapons and scenarios and stuff, and the reality of policymakers making decisions about the use of nuclear weapons. And I think that the logics that we use and the kinds of analytics that we use just won't apply in the event. I'm not saying that they won't ever be used. But I think that, that um, I mean, the nuclear taboo is, is, is rooted in something very deep um, about the sense of both uncertainty about what it means to start down this road and, uh, and responsibility. And so, again, I, I'm not saying that, that it is unovercomable. I think actually Putin may be capable of doing it. But I just think that the way we think about how do you analyze the use and kind of war game this out just doesn't apply to thinking about it. And so when you know, we say it's just highly, it's because it's high, because the way in which analysts think about this is just very different than people who would actually have to make the decision to use it. So let me, I'll ask a question because I, Question. So, I, and there are two. Um, I want to go back to to Frank's question to you about the regional hegemony uh, question. Um, I always begin all of these with the assumption that other things being equal, every country would like to have more control over their environment than less. And right. So, if you told people, "What's your first choice?" I'd like to have hegemony. Right. I mean, Belgium would like to have hegemony. Right. It's it's it, of course. I mean, it's better to control your fate and to have things under. So you can say what it is. So it's everybody's first choice. I don't think anybody would say, I'd like to be vulnerable, I'd like to be weak. So I never thought that was the question, is do people want it? It's a question of what, how important is it and are there alternatives to them that would be acceptable? So put in the regional context, um, no doubt, I mean, I agree with you, that, that given the choice, you know, China would like to recreate what it had, you know, in the Ming Dynasty, and, right, it, it, which is tributary states and people around who just kind of did what they, the Chinese told them. 
But I go back to thinking about, you know, the after World War II and Europe and the Soviet Union. And, you know, their Churchill was for neutralizing the Central Europe and, and creating a, an alternative that would provide a degree of security for both sides where nobody would have hegemony. And, and the question is, uh, you know, whether our assumptions about China's behaviors, because it doesn't like U.S. hegemony, necessarily means that China itself needs hegemony and wants it. And so go back to Frank's question is, I mean, how would we know the difference between, you know, let's imagine that there was an option to neutralize East Asia. No, you know, they don't dominate, we don't dominate, and we've got a lot of Finlands out there. Is, is that an outcome? And what would, what would that mean for the United States? And we like our alliances, and, they, and there's a lot of comfort in it because we have control. But that's the first one. The second one, Hal, is we've got to mention Ukraine in this context. I mean, and I think it'd just be interested in your own views huge amount of speculation about does this change the Chinese calculus in any way, and there are lots of different dimensions to that, but just I know you've given yeah. it some thoughts, so maybe you could say something about that. Yeah, the, the, fir the first one's, a, I mean, it's a really interesting question, and I guess I'm just, I mean, maybe you can help me with this. Like, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of an example in history where you have a region that is successfully Finlandized, right? Of, of a region as as large and dynamic as East East Asia, and there were proposals to do it, right? Ken and Churchill and others during during the Cold War, and you never got there because neither side was confident that the other side would ultimately respect it, right? And so I, I think the problem you would run up against, and I, maybe I just can't take off like the Washington blinders be, here. You know, my favorite of this is to think about. Yeah, yeah. The, kind of the, the basic assumptions behind Helsinki, which was a little bit of kind of neutral. Well, I get a, a little bit, although it was also a little bit of like political warfare, right? And and so hoping that this would undermine uh, the Soviet bloc and, and, you know, and so. But it had, you know, arms control. And had yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. And and so I guess I guess the, the reason I'm, I'm struggling with it a little bit is that if, like, imagine we could create that sort of arrangement now. The the problem would be the same as the critiques of Kinnan's Program A in 1948, which is how do you know the other side's going to respect it? And once you have given up the positions that you hold now, how can you compel compliance with the agreement in in the future? And so maybe maybe I'm just not being imaginative enough now. But but even if that was acceptable, the China I don't know that it's it's achievable in, in reality. I guess I want to think a little bit more about it. The, um, on Ukraine, um, th this is truly in the realm of speculation, right? Because when we talk about, you know, China's lessons from Ukraine, there will be kind of like the formal, you know, the PLA will have a lessons learned process from Ukraine, and some of that will actually play out in places where we can see it, right? It'll play out in military journals and, and things like that. But of course, the most important lessons, like what are Xi Jinping's lessons, and no, nobody knows, right? And so I guess I, I would say that um, you can make an argument that, that surely this has to make Xi Jinping more cautious because he's seen how good U.S. intelligence is, right? He has seen you know, how painful the economic sanctions package that the democracies can put together is. He's seen how difficult conquest is when you have a committed defender and all of that stuff. And, and so why wouldn't that make him kind of go, go slow, even if he was inclined um, to go fast? I guess the, the counterpoint, though, is that, you know, I, I'm not sure that Xi Jinping thinks that the two cases are, are equivalent, right? And, and so um, I don't know that, that Xi Jinping has as much respect for Taiwan's will to fight, for instance, as much of the world now has for Ukraine's will, will to fight. Um, I think it's entirely possible that the Chinese leadership may not believe that the United States would do some of the things to China that it has done to Russia in this conflict. You know, would we really sanction the Chinese central bank, right? That, that's, that's a much bigger lift than sanctioning the Russian central bank, um, for, for instance. Um, you know, it, it could convince him that, you know, Putin's mistake was not the invasion of Ukraine. It was not doing it decisively in the opening days and having sort of this goofy plan that was going to come to to ruin because there were five separate axes of advance and 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 so on and so forth. I, I can't I can't confidently say which of those theses I find more plausible because there's just not much evidence to to go on. 
I guess I would say that I, I'm not entirely sure why the first one would be more plausible than the second, given what we know about kind of the trajectory of Chinese foreign policy over the past decade. Um, and it's a, it's a speculative and uncertain answer, but I, I think it's probably the best that I can do at this point. Are you saying we have time for one more or we're done? We could do one, we could do one more. Okay. So try to interpret the signals. Okay, one final question. Not too much pressure, but Megan, an excellent one. Uh, hi, uh, Amir Zoshi, first year MAIR. Um, so my question is, I recently uh, heard in a podcast in The Economist uh, called The Prince on Xi Jinping. And uh, to paraphrase The Economist, uh, the, uh, they said that uh, the reason for his survival is that he believes in becoming redder than red, is the, is the, pra is the phrase that they used. Uh, so my question to you would be, uh, do you think uh, the... His, his kind of obligation to prove himself to his people, uh, leave uh, the reunification of Taiwan as his legacy, uh, overrides all other uh, economic or, or uh, kind of uh, any other rationale uh, in taking over Taiwan? No. So, so I, I think it's, it's a powerful motivator. But if I thought it was going to override everything else, right, there, there'd be no point in having policy recommendations in, in the book, right, because it's going to happen one way or another. I mean, I, I think it is possible to make, you know, an effort to force unification with Taiwan look really unattractive and uncertain, even for an increasingly risk-acceptant, highly motivated Xi Jinping, right? And, and so the question, and that's, that's the analytical bet, right, that we're making in, in the book. And so that being the case, what I'd prefer to see is, is lots of policies that make it look like an invasion of Taiwan is just going to be every bit as much of a disaster for China as Frank and Andy say it is. Right? And so even as Xi Jinping you know, comes into this, this window uh, of danger that we talk about, he says, yeah, that's a little bit much for me. I don't want to take that, that risk. And so I, I think that you know, the, the calculus of Chinese leaders is still shapeable, uh, and I very much hope that it is. Excellent. Well, um, thank you, Hal, for a terrific presentation, a great book. I'd highly recommend, for those who haven't read it, to go out and uh, get a copy. And um, thank you for the terrific questions, and please join me in thanking him.